The reason why certain people turn to philosophy, why I became a philosopher, was that since I was a little boy, I always felt that existence as such was weird. I mean, here we are. Isn't that odd? Of course it's odd. What do, you, what do you mean by odd? Well, it's what's different from even. I mean, what's odd stands out. What's even lies flat. But you can't see the outstanding without the flat background. Here's the thing standing out. It's odd. Each one of you is odd. Strange, unique, particular, different. How do we know what we mean by that? Except against the background of something even, that is not differentiated, like space. And so you get this philosophical itch. You begin to scratch your head and think about why is that so? Well, after a while, you realize that's a meaningless question. And you ask, how is it so? Well, that leads you into science and other investigations. So you want to know, what is it? I mean, this, this happening, this thing called existence, what is it? And you ask that question long enough and it suddenly hits you that if you could answer it, you wouldn't know what terms to put the answer in. I mean, when we investigate the properties of nature, and we do get some answers, all the answers are in terms of particular structures, forms, patterns. And these can be measured, and their behavior can be predicted. But when I want to ask the question, what are the forms made of? I mean, what is it really? We can't think of any way in which we could answer the question. Because we would have to have a class of all classes. When you ask the question, what? It's like saying, is you is or is you ain't? Is you animal? Is you vegetable? Is you mineral? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Are you male or female? Are you a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or what have you? We classify always to give an answer to the question, what is it? And when you classify, you distinguish an inside group from an outside group. Right. So what we want to know is what is the group of all groups? Well, we can't imagine what the outside would be. So we can't answer the question. What is it? So the physicists finally abandoned the quest for stuff. And they gave us a description of the universe entirely in terms of form. The pattern, not the stuff. When people ask, what's the web? Yeah, but you can't do that. What's the pattern made of? Surely there mustn't be an answer to that. See, what happens is, when you turn up the microscope, all stuff turns into form. It becomes articulate. You know, the carpet uh, looks like some sort of stuff. But when you look at it under a microscope, you will see the crystalline structure of the nylon or whatever it's made of. See? They want to know what are those crystals made of. All right? Turn up the volume and you'll find uh, molecules. Turn up the volume. You find wavicles. But we think the, the, the wavicles must be of something. But of course they're not. We find substance or stuff totally vanishes. We say, does it matter? What does that mean? Does it matter? Is it important? In other words, does it measure up to anything? Matter comes from a Sanskrit root, matra, 
which means to measure. So from this root matra, we get going on into Sanskrit, we get the word maya. And maya is generally translated illusion, although it also means magic, creative power. The word illusion, switch over, we get that from Latin. And that comes from the Latin ludere, to play. Let's pretend that we matter. See, the world is a musical phenomenon. Good music never refers to anything except the music itself. You don't ask Mr. Bach, Mr. Ravi Shankar, what do you mean by this music? What is it intended to express? Listen. That's the meaning. Giraffes are giraffing, trees are treeing, stars are starring, clouds are clouding. Rain is raining. And if you don't understand, look at it again. <laughs> and people are people. Wow. We notice that all these suchnesses appear and disappear. They keep changing. They come and they go. But if you get hung up on your particular form, I'll have to alter the language a little bit because, you see, your form makes a duality. Whereas you are your form. You're what you're doing. Now, you think... Mm, for some strange reason, I must make that go on as long as possible. And therefore, you think you have an instinct to survive. And so the only thing anybody can agree about today, so far as the discussion of ethical and moral problems are concerned, is that we ought to survive. And therefore, certain forms of conduct have survival value and certain forms don't. But when you say to yourself, you must go on living, you put yourself in a double bind. Because you said to a process which is essentially spontaneous that it must happen. And the basic form of the double bind which is imposed upon all children is you are required to do that which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. So when we say to ourselves, you must go on, the reason is, you see, that we are not living in the eternal now, where reality is. We are always thinking that the satisfaction of life will be coming later. Don't kid yourself. Which is to say, only suckers put hope in the future. 